and welcome to Coronanomics, What Just Happened, brought to you by Econ Films, where we look at the biggest events of yet another historic week with you, our live audience. So join the conversation on our YouTube comments or on Twitter using the hashtag Coronanomics. I'm Lizzie Verdon, economics reporter at The Telegraph. And I'm Ben Chu, economics editor of The Independent. So once again, the last seven days have seen a welter of coronavirus related news from the go-ahead to socially distanced barbecues, to a confirmation of post-holiday quarantine, to today's suggestion that people, instruction rather, that people should wear a mask when they go on public transport. And a big question has emerged. Do we need a new royal yacht to showcase Britain and lift our spirits in these coronavirus ravaged times? A snip at just 100 million pounds. <laughs> Joining us to talk about all that and more are Jagjit Chadha, director of the mighty Nas National Institute of Economic and Social Research think tank, which celebrated its 82nd birthday this week. Happy and birthday. Which, happy Thank birthday. You. And I which helped the day launch... I break you one. <laughs> <laughs> and which helped launch the Economics Observatory, a, con a collective initiative by the UK economic research community to answer questions on the economics of the COVID-19 crisis. We're also joined by Karis Roberts, Executive Director of IPPR, one of Britain's leading think tanks. Jagjit, Karis, welcome to you both. Thank you very Hi. much for having Thanks us. For so guys, first of all, we've got, we want to introduce a new feature uh, on mm -hmm. what just happened. It's called Guess the Graph. So you're going to see a graph <laughs> with its, one, of the, one of the axes labels removed. And you can see there, Australia, UK, USA. Whoa, what happened to Germany? Why did Germany spike up? So the question is, what do you think that graph represents? Is it A, car sales, B, easy jet flights, C, hot dog sales, D, restaurant bookings? And if you're watching at home, you can enter your answer on our Twitter poll and we'll reveal the answer at the end of the show. That's the Twitter um, at Coronanomics TV. So, first of all, Jagjit, Karis, what are your guesses? Jagjit, what do I, you think? I I'd go for restaurant bookings. I think I could imagine. Okay. With uh, um, the differentiation, that's what I do. I was going to say that, but I can't say the same thing. So I'm going to have to go with hot dog sales. <laughs> I don't know what happened to oh, hot dog stands good. in Germany in this time, but one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, we'll find out um, in probably just under an hour's time, so stay tuned. Um, first of all, moments of the week, our regular feature. Let's start with you, Jagjit. What what caught your eye this week? What was your big moment? Well, a lot of moments, obviously, politically and otherwise, as society starts to deal with the terrible consequences of COVID-19 and the lockdown that we're seeing. But if I just abstract from those a little bit, the, the number that caught my eye was the extent to which households have repaid debt in net terms mm -hmm. in the UK um, uh, in April. That's April rather than May at the moment. So we could expect those numbers to continue. Typically households in the UK in the last 10 or so years have been taking on a little bit more debt every month of about a million, a billion dollars. But in April, they paid down um, over $7 billion, about a, a pounds rather, 7 billion pounds, about a third of a percent of GDP. Uh, it's, a, it's the largest number that we've seen since these kinds of records have been available. And very much in line with what we'd expect, having said that, because um, households have gone through a period of forced savings. They can't spend money in restaurants or in other places as the way we might have anticipated. But also, they're probably taking the view they're going to be poorer for quite some time. And as a result, if they possibly can, they want to pay down some debt. That's what, exactly what they've done. So a big yeah. number. I want to follow it, you know, it. We often worry about the sort of indebtedness of the British consumer, especially unsecured well, debt. And yet when these recessions come along, Jagjit, it's always a kind of, we don't want them to start dissaving all at the same time. You know, we want them to do it because that's generally bad for the economy. Is it different this time because people can't go out and spend? Is it, should, are we slightly less worried about people's saving rates going up this time, do you think? I don't think it's, uh, there are two things. Firstly, it's a good idea to pay down debt. But household debt is around 85% of GDP. It's a high number by long-term standards. And if there are some opportunities to pay that down, that's a good idea. And that's what households have done. Um, and at the moment, of course, it is exactly as a result of the fact households can't go out and spend in the way that they would have done. 
Um, and, and therefore, the savings are ones that um, are, are available for the government to borrow and inject some more demand into the economy. So rather than borrowing from abroad, which the government has typically done in, in the economic cycle, it can borrow directly this year from households. In fact, we mm. expect household saving to go well into double figures this year for the first time for a very long time. And that means that we can fund the deficits that the government is running without turning to overseas investors, which will help um, the mm. government meet the demands of society at this terrible time. Yeah, and Karis, do you, what were your impressions when you saw that amazing figure that Jagdit highlighted of £7 billion pounds of uh, debt uh, paid down in a single month? Mm. I mean, it's a fascinating uh, statistic and, you know, quite something to absorb. I think the thing we have to remember, though, is that it's an aggregate figure um, mm -hmm. and we need to be looking at the distributional picture as well and who um, who is in that picture. Um, so we know that lots of households are going to be saving lots of money. We think that many will be saving around £200 uh, pounds a month or so, which they can put towards paying off debt or um, which they can put into savings. Uh, but we also know that... Uh, a group of other people are very likely to be accumulating debt um, throughout this period. For instance, mm -hmm. if they've been made unemployed, particularly when the furlough scheme ends, I think there's going to be a lot of people really struggling for cash. And so there is actually a risk that some people will be uh, gathering huge debts and indebtedness can appear somewhere else um, in the system. So I think it's important and um, it's, you know, Judge, it's completely right, but we need to look beneath the bonnet as well um, at who who's in that picture. Yeah. Um, um, can I just add? The, yeah, the, go ahead. Yeah, Karis is absolutely right. I'm, I'm afraid you've got two economists who are going to agree with each other a lot here this evening, but that's <laughs> a good thing just to demonstrate that. Uh, but th that's why it's so incumbent upon Treasury, Great George Street, and fiscal policy to do something about that. There is money available. The sense in which we can't issue the debt is not the case this time round. Uh, the borrowing rates are very low, which is something we might come to later. And the, the, this is a pool of savings that can be exploited in a sense by the government to offset exactly those vulnerable households that Karis is talking about. We do need an active set of fiscal policies here and we have got yeah. the means and the resources to act upon it. Yeah, you're quite right. We will definitely get onto that subject. <laughs> but uh, before that, uh, Karis, uh, what was your moment of the week? So my moment of the week uh, was earlier this week on Monday when 200 business leaders um, came together to call for a green recovery plan uh, from the government. And that included some quite surprising names, so BP, National Grid, Heathrow Airport, um, and similar calls have uh, now been made by the Pope, by Prince Charles, by Boris Johnson. Um, and I guess without wanting to get kind of too uh, optimistic as someone who cares about uh, tackling the climate crisis, I do think what this clearly shows is that the agenda has really shifted on this issue. Um, a very large group of people, this is an issue that uh, brings different actors together, trade unions, businesses um, and civic leaders. And this time there is no excuse, there has to be a green recovery. Um, I'm actually quite optimistic that we will get one of sorts, perhaps not big enough or fast enough. And I would urge the government to act um, as, with as much speed as they can. Um, but I do think it's a really interesting moment in terms of the politics of that having shifted. Mm -hmm. It was interesting uh, with the launch of the next Davos summit, Prince Charles was calling for a similar thing. You know, the theme of the summit this year, of next year, will be the Great Reset so that recovering from coronavirus will be done in a green way. Um, but Karis, don't you think it was a bit hypocritical for all these global elites who will be travelling all the way to Davos to be saying, you know, flying, to be saying, let's do it in a green way? Yeah, and to be honest, it's also the tip of the iceberg when it comes to hypocrisy, because obviously the unusual players in there, they're also some of the biggest contributors um, to climate change. And what we have to be careful of is that we don't accept this and actually it's a greenwash uh, for there not being action. But I do think the reality has shifted for the government. They're going to need to uh, have a stimulus to recover the economy. Um, it so happens that we need £30 billion a year of investment by our calculations to tackle the climate crisis. Um, so there's a ready-made set of uh, jobs to be invested in and set of public investment for them to do. So I think that's what's shifted the debate. I know you're not naming names, but one of the uh, people who appeared on that digital launch was uh, Bernard Looney, the chief executive of BP, who um, the Methodist Church Investment Fund divested from this week because they said that it's not um, green enough. So, yeah, I could definitely agree with the, you know, it's, it's a little bit hypocritical. 
Yeah, so you, I think you're exactly you, right. So remember, if you've got a question for us or our guests, um, please do uh, put it in our YouTube mentions, or you can uh, find us on Twitter at at with the hashtag Ash at Coronanomics. So, Lizzie, now you're going to tell us about your moment of the week, aren't you? Yeah, for me, it was um, when the former UK Treasury Minister Jim O'Neill um, suggested that the Treasury should change the Bank of England's remit from targeting inflation to targeting nominal GDP to help in engineer a V-shaped recovery from the coronavirus crisis. Um, we had him on this programme. Um, and interestingly, sources around the Treasury are saying that it is something is, that's being considered, although we don't know how actively. We also had Gerard Lyons, um, Boris Johnson's former economic advisor, saying that he thinks it's a good idea. Um, Jagjit, do you think that there's any chance of the government making such a massive change in the middle of a crisis like this? Uh, it's an interesting idea uh, to go to nominal income targeting. I, I've got to say that I think inflation targeting has focused our minds on price stability as a society. We have accepted the consensus for that before we adopted inflation targeting. And since um, we adopted it, and particularly since operational independence now 23 years ago, we've hit that target year after year and, and actually delivered what we were supposed to deliver. And that's a good idea because the bank, in a sense, is able to control inflation. It's got a, a bunch of models and a, a bunch of tools in order to make inflation hit the target. A growth target, which by which we mean real growth in the economy, the productive capacity of the economy, is traditionally thought to be outside of the control of the central bank. It's all about real stuff, the quality of our labour force, the level of the capital employed, the productivity enhancements and the things we might learn from trade. All of these things are, are, are really microeconomic questions that are not typically ones that the central bank can control. So in principle, by going to an income target, you're asking the central bank to deliver something it can't and also potentially undermining the clarity of the inflation target. And it's incredibly important at this time of economic crisis when there is a hugely expansionary fiscal policy, which, which I agree, and in fact, it could be even more expansionary. And the Bank of England is running expansionary monetary policy that we don't let the people get into their heads that we're relaxing the inflation target because the expansionary mm -hmm. benefit would be lost if everyone started thinking inflation was going to rise to three to four to five percent immediately that would affect the price at which we could issue debt and the interest rates we paid upon it what we're able to do at the moment because of the credibility of the inflation target is keep interest rates low to help the economy adjust when this crisis starts to ebb away uh, and it's, this is not the time, I would say, to start tinkering around with something that, broadly speaking, has worked. But, Karis, um, surely the number one thing that we need right now is a V-shaped recovery. And even if that's hugely optimistic, shouldn't we be doing everything we can to, to get it? Interesting question. I mean, I'd broadly agree with what Jagjit said. I think um, there's another point, though, which isn't just who has the capacity to make change in the economy is who has control over it and what kind of economic activity we're trying to create is a hugely political question it's not necessarily just a technocratic decision um, and so that does come down to fiscal policy and that fiscal policy should be democratically governed um, the other thing that i would say and um this comes down to kind of whether GDP should be the overall focus of our economy and government policy, not just the Bank of England. Of course, it can be very tempting to think what well, the thing that matters most is shooting back up and getting a V-shaped recovery. Um, but I do think now is precisely the time to be thinking about what kind of economic activity we want to bring back. Um, and we should be focusing on, for instance, well-paid jobs. That's going to be important for people's incomes, important for aggregate demand. It's also going to be important for tax revenues. Um, so I would kind of question whether a kind of embedding further, a relentless focus on GDP um, over other characteristics would actually be what we want in any case. Great. Well, we've got a question now uh, from James in Manchester. Um, he wrote to us on Twitter and he asks, how do we know whether the economy is operating at potential or not post coronavirus? Jagjit, what do you think about that? Ties in nicely with what we were just talking about. Absolutely. And I think where I agree with Karis as well is that this is a time to be thinking about the rebalancing of the economy. We talked about the greening of the economy, but people may not have noticed in the past few weeks, uh, Professor Parthadas Gupta at Cambridge has published his bio biodiversity review, which was commissioned by the previous Conservative administration. And it makes a, a many, many serious points 
about the extent to which we have to think not only about um, a much lower carbon utilization future, but how we can guarantee the biomass that, that we, we require for the continuation of human life on this planet. And that's a really big picture. But I think that feeds all the way down to the balances in the economy that we can now observe to be an unbalance. And that can go from all the way from the provision of our health networks, which have to be more resilient than they have in the past, ensuring ba better balanced growth across the regions that we have, as well as thinking about the people who are currently often have very high skills, but low paid jobs. And are maybe running lives that are too demanding for them in terms of the return that they get and how we create an environment where their lives become more stable. And I think that should all be bedded into where we go uh, in terms of the economy and planning over the next few years. So we don't necessarily want to go back to where we were. We probably want to think of a different structure for the economy. And in there as well, I would argue is a case for trying to think about more manufacturing in the economy, rather uh, as a, at least as a way of creating more resilience for our domestic supply of goods, but also providing lots of opportunities for service sector that feeds off that manufacturing. It's something to be thinking about now and, and creating the correct preconditions for economy to grow in that way rather than it has in the 90s and the noughties, I would say. Mm -hmm. Paris, surely we've got no idea what the potential of the economy would have been without coronavirus. Say, uh, with the US, uh, with President Trump blaming um, China for the origins of the virus and then stoking up the US-China trade war again. Um, how do we know what would have happened in, in terms of the trade relationship and that's impact on the global economy if, if it hadn't been for coronavirus? How can we answer James's question? It's a very tricky question to answer at the best of times and one that uh, gets economists arguing um, in plentiful supply. Um, so I, I felt slightly amused when I heard it because um, we're certainly not going to answer it tonight. Um, I do think one thing that's very clear, though, and one thing that pretty much everyone agrees on is that when you have huge levels of unemployment and um, the economy is not operating at capacity, um, and the Bank of England estimate that by the end of the year, we will see unemployment rates of about 10%. Um, and I think that creates a really big shift in terms of what the focus of economic policy is going to need to be. Uh, so following the last recession, actually unemployment didn't reach as high um, levels as that or as high as you would have expected. So this is sort of a return to a problem that public policy hasn't had to deal with on this scale for some time. Um, and that is a real challenge that we're going to have to face. Um, so we know that it's not going to be operating at capacity, certainly by the end of the year. Uh, the job will be to get the people who are unemployed into well-paid, good jobs. And Ben, what was your moment of the week? Well, my moment of the week uh, was when the schools went back on Monday. So after this long uh, lockdown period, a lot of schools opened up their doors to some pupils, not all. And I think that's really what I want to talk about. It's the fact that I think there's about 8 million children still not in schools and that is a really really important um, thing and a really quite dangerous thing we had a prediction from david laws a former um, education secretary this week that some schools might not even open in september it might be not maybe october or even november before they go back and i think we've really got to start focusing on the potential damage particularly to children from uh, more vulnerable uh, from lower income households there was a government commissioned report out this week which didn't get the, the attention which I think it deserved and it suggested that 10 years of work in reducing the education attainment gap between poor children, people from poor families and people from uh, other families uh, could be reduced. 10 years of achievement could be wiped out because of this lockdown. We really need to start thinking about ways to sort of mitigate some of this damage of these children not being in school whether that's sort of summer tuition if that's a possibility but really neat you know this i think this should be absolutely at the forefront of policy makers minds now that's that sort of um educational inequality we've also got a question on gender inequality um from julia rouse and she's actually going to ask this live she's head of the sylvia pankhurst gender research center Center at Manchester Metropolitan University. Can we bring in uh, Julia? Hello, Julia. Hello. Hello. So, so can you give us your question for uh, Jagja and uh, Karis? Yeah, so I'm really concerned that women-led businesses and particularly mother-led businesses are gonna be the collateral damage really of COVID-19. They tend to mm. trade in sectors where social distancing is most difficult. They've obviously got massive economic and social shock to deal with. 
But the closure of schools and nurseries, which for me is a chronic problem, and we don't know when our children are going to go back, what days of the week, in what pattern, months into the future, means taking on work and committing to it is really difficult. And I'm concerned that the massive imbalance we have in the entrepreneurship stock is going to be even enhanced quite radically further by losing a generation of mother-led businesses. So my question to you is, do you think policy makers are even thinking about this or they even care? Do you want to field that one first, Karis? Is this something that's high on the agenda of uh, this cabinet, do you feel? Well, it should be. We know that there are going to be huge <laughs> dimensions, um, gender dimensions to coronavirus, not just in terms of who has been working on the front line, who's more exposed to the virus, but in terms of who is able to uh, go to work. And for instance, the furlough scheme, the job retention scheme uh, was not available on a part time basis, which uh, is likely to disadvantage women who need to access it. I think the self-employment point um, is really important. That partly also relates, of course, to how much support the government offered to um, self-employed people, but it does also relate to schools and nurseries. And one thing that worries me is that when schools and nurseries do eventually supposedly return, how many private providers in nursery provision in particular will have gone under? Um, mm -hmm. Is that system fit to cope with the return, uh, with that gap and then the return um, of all those children? And I think as well as talking about the physical infrastructure investment that we need, the government needs to be talking about the social infrastructure that will be part of uh, an effective recovery that enables people to go back to work, including women. Um, so I think it's absolutely critical. Do I think this cabinet is thinking about it? Honestly, the signs are not particularly encouraging um, in terms of the policies that have been implemented so far. They don't seem to take this dimension uh, into account in its full import. I'm not sure that's sustainable, though. I think at some point um, when there are millions of women across the country wanting to get back to work and they're struggling to do so, that becomes a really big political issue for the government. Mm. And Jagda, do you think there could be sort of specific policies aimed at helping female entrepreneurs? Is that something you would like to see? I, I, I think I would like to um, encourage the government, and we've already done this at the Treasury Committee a couple of weeks ago. The, the way the crisis emerged and, and happened, I think it obviously surprised everyone. And there was a, a powerful response in the budget in March, probably more than we anticipated, to help with the furlough scheme and the business interruption loan schemes that were more than we might have anticipated in March. But now a few months on, some of the gaps in that are emerging. The gender issue is one, uh, uh, clearly, particularly for entrepreneurs and particularly for mothers who unfortunately still share mo much more of the burden of domestic uh, chores than they might otherwise. And also the point that Ben raised is how do we get schools to work for people who have to uh, uh, continue with their work without the burden burden is the wrong word, without the distraction of having to look after their children. So we might need some support for schools there as well. Um, and then there's the other questions about, we were learning that the first set of policies seem to be only operating for a very short period, which is something I think um, Julia was coming to, is it doesn't allow people to plan. If I'm thinking about a business, I want to plan three, six months, a year ahead. So we needed many more um, unconditional statements that th this support will be in place for as long as the crisis is in place. And the crisis will be in place for as long as there's a lockdown and until we've found a suitable vaccine for COVID-19. So it has to be what economists call state contingent support for as long as the economy is suffering. For as long as state labour supply is withdrawn in many areas of the economy, we have to think about areas in which to provide support. And I think the way the government needs to do that is to think of a, a summer budget or an emergency budget in which a large number of these measures could be considered. Having done something and realising it wasn't enough in a certain number of sectors and areas, it now has to think what more it can do and target the issues being raised by Julia, but also by, for example, new starters, who many of whom found themselves yeah. falling between new stools, uh, expecting to find that they could start a new job, but then being laid off even before they started their job. And this has affected anything up to somewhere between 100,000 to 500,000 people. And I, I'm not saying it's the government's fault, but not having observed it before it happened. But once it's happened, I think there is an obligation to do something about it. Because in the end, this particular crisis is a natural disaster. It's not anything, it's not any particular individual's fault. And we have to look to the government 
for appropriate levels of insurance to support people as they confront the ongoing issues raised by this. So I think the point Julia makes is very well taken and we need to push the government really for more detailed responses to the issues that have emerged rather than the drip of this daily update that doesn't really help anyone, it seems to me. I would like it all collected into a summer emergency budget. That's that's how I think we should tackle it. Julia, are you happy there. with what you've heard? Oh, sorry, go ahead, Karis, please. Sorry. Yeah, just to say, I do think it's extraordinary that the duration of the measures does not seem to be linked to the lockdown being lifted. Um, so in terms of the furlough scheme, in terms of support for self-employed, mm. that's apparently going to be lifted with no consideration of whether those people can actually go back to work, which is just introducing a huge cliff edge in terms of those businesses and in terms of those jobs falling uh, falling off and uh, adding to unemployment stats. And that just seems extraordinary. Mm. Julia, are you? Do you feel that answered your question, or do you? What do you feel? Well, yeah. I mean, we've got probably seven hundred and fifty thousand excluded from the self-employment income support scheme. We've got business directors whose dividends aren't covered. So the idea, I think, the country has that small businesses have been well protected is false, and mm. we're going to have an avalanche of failures. That's not good for the economy, and it's a disaster for families. What we haven't even got a commitment to is that they're going to collect gender disaggregated data because we know women business owners are less likely to borrow and with good reason because they work in sectors that tend to have less potential. In fact, there's some really shocking statistics about how low incomes from self-employment. So the idea that a lot of these sole traders can repay debt is, is, is a bit ludicrous, really. So who under this sort of uncertainty and the recession would want to borrow. So we need gender disaggregated data to work out whether or not the bounce back loans and other loans are being taken up. And then we need to take very seriously the problem if they're not being taken up, because it isn't because there isn't a financial crisis in women led businesses. I mean, there are of course a crisis in all businesses, but I think we've got this particularly gendered factor around childcare and sector, which is highly gendered in this crisis. And we really do need to see the government paying some attention to that. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Julia. I mean, that's definitely an issue that we're going to come back to again and again, because it's, as you say, it's incredibly important. Okay. Yeah, and the gender, the gender question's just got so many different dimensions. Thanks, Julia. Thank you. Thanks, Julia. Um, if anyone at home's got a question, feel free to ask away on the YouTube comments or on Twitter using the hashtag Coronanomics. Now, another moment of the week has obviously been um, the protests all over the world um, against police brutality and racism after the killing of George Floyd by a policeman. Um, Karis, I wonder, do you think that the anger has been even more charged because of the economic suffering of COVID, because of COVID-19? I think it has, and in several ways. I don't think you can really understand the two as separate because we do know the COVID-19 has had very different effects um, by ethnicity. So here in England and Wales, uh, black people have been four times as likely uh, to die of coronavirus than white people. And that's a statistic that should shock us. Um, there's been a lot of debate over what's driving it. Um, the best research that I've seen suggests that a very large chunk of that is down to um, the, the socioeconomic status of, of black people in this country um, in terms of wealth, in terms of health outco outcomes. And that is should shame us all, I think, in terms of policy making. Um, so I think you can't disaggregate these different issues that are going on. Um, we know as well in terms of employment effects um, that uh, people from different groups are likely to have be more or less likely to be in insecure work, lose their jobs, etc. Um, and COVID-19 is also an issue in terms of ethnicity. And Jagjit, um, do you think that the unrest surrounding all this could impact the recovery? I have to sort of echo what, what, what Cara said. I think that the recovery is, is ultimately going to be a function of the lockdown, how that gets eased, and the activism of fiscal policy that gets implemented. And we need a detailed, granular response for fiscal policy, which is absent. And I think that'll be the dominant factor in, 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 in the recovery. But I think I must very much echo um, 
Karras's words that, that the the morbidities and the effects of of BAME communities in in this is very much reflecting um, the the, the socio economic conditions that they find themselves in the, the the, the level of pay, the skills level that have been attained. For a set of simple stylized facts, about 30% of the population can work persistently at home and retain their income levels. And they're, of course, people in professional classes uh, working in the service sector um, and with very high levels of educational attainment. Um, that automatically skews that as a problem uh, that's more for people with lower levels of education attainment who live in more socio-economic deprived places. And we live in a country where th that is very much more dominated by people from those communities. And that is exposing, as crises mm -hmm. often do, existing poor structures of the economy and problems that have existed for a long time. So the best thing we yeah. can do is, is watch what's going on, observe it and respond to it. We've actually got a question on this subject from uh, Jason Nolan in Belfast. Let's, um, let's listen mm -hmm. to Jason. Uh, my question is, to what extent has the COVID-19 outbreak uh, had a regressive effect here in the UK and globally? And to what extent has it disproportionately affected uh, BAME communities? Um, and second to that, what policy prescriptions might you suggest to limit or mitigate such disproportional uh, effects of future natural disasters or crises? So I think, uh, Karis, we've established that it has had a disproportionate impact. Maybe you could mm. focus on the second part of Jason's question, like what should the policy response look like to stop this kind of thing happening? Well, so the, there is a differential uh, effect in terms of how incomes are affected um, by any period of sickness, by potential loss of a job um, and those sorts of things. And that indicates that one of the really important things that the government can do to um, ensure that groups don't and people from particular groups don't enter into hardship is have a proper social safety net. Um, and universal credit uh, has been shown, I think, to many people who have started claiming it for the first time to be inadequate. Uh, so I would argue that we should strengthen universal credit. It would pick up lots of those holes identified in the, um, in the schemes that have been announced so far that have been welcome, but there are big gaps um, and we're asking as a consequence people to exist on not very much uh, money at all. And um, so I would strengthen the social safety net um, as a first step to enable people to take the time off if they're unwell, um, to stay at home if they need to self-isolate rather than getting on public transport and going into work. Um, and uh, that would be a very strong basis on which to, to move, yeah. go on from there. And Jack, do you, do you agree that sort of a stronger safety net self welfare safety net will help all people BAME and the entire community or do you need specific um, uh, welfare for, for certain groups what do you feel? Um, I, I think the safety net in the way Karis has outlined makes a great deal of sense um, to the extent to which there may be uh, language issues or cultural or social issues that mean certain communities may want not to access those safety nets that was a problem I think in the 1980s and 90s. I'm not familiar with more recent research, but anything that encourages people to take up their rights in terms of social safety net would be helpful. So whether we need more staff at these places to help process the number of people applying, the numbers are overwhelming. They're astonishing in terms of the people looking for this level of support. And we might want to think about being more elastic in our allocation of people to deal with those problems. I just want to add two further points to Karis's, mm -hmm. which I know she's talked about anyway, so I'm really stealing the ideas. But um, we need to think about retraining, making basic training available through further education colleges or schools or universities for people who want to shift into different careers so they have the opportunity to do that. And, and where possible to also think about grants or loans so that those who want to start small businesses or get them off the ground can access that money freely. Often there's a great administrative burden with getting these things off the ground. So if we had those facilities available for these for people who need that level of support made much more easier to access. The admin is often the issue here. That would help these ideas turn into businesses, turn into employment and do something to change some of these people's outcomes. That'd be very important. Absolutely. Well, again, this is another subject where I think it's going to keep coming up. Uh, remember, if you've got a question for us, uh, leave a question in the YouTube comments or uh, ask us on Twitter, hashtag Coronanomics. 
So now we've got a question from Paul Kearney, who's a lecturer in economics at the University of Westminster. Is Paul there? How concerned should we be about the impact of COVID on different age groups in the labour market? Um, will the burden be especially hard for young workers, uh, the scarring impact, and older workers who might be seen as frail and, and perhaps might face discrimination? We know that uh, COVID's hit the old harder in, in a medical health sense, but economically, Jadjit, what sort of evidence have you seen at NISA? Well, I, th I think we, we've seen, uh, you know, we're, as the bank, but probably even worse, we think unemployment's going to go um, well into double figures, 12% or more. And if we added uh, the people furloughed, that, that could go to a number even as high as 20% once we start to think about those numbers. And we know very well from research done over many years that when the young um, don't enter into the employment network in their early years, that has a permanent effect on their income over the rest of their lifetime. They don't build up the networks or the skills that people do uh, when they enter the labour market immediately. So the classic kind of research here is to look at what happens to people who enter the labour market during a recession. And then you look at the same set of people when they enter the labour market a couple of years later when the recession is over, and you see these permanent effects. So people find out throughout the course of their working lives, they're relatively disadvantaged. So we need to address that by thinking about the retraining and the opportunities that might develop for them, as well as firms will be rethinking how they want to deploy their resources um, following the, the, the sort of reorientation of the economy that we talked about. So I think these are really key areas that we need to provide support for the young to deal with this persistent shock. Uh, in, in terms of the of the old, um, yes, there will have to be some rethinking about the kind of work that they're able to do, particularly if their mortality rates are ones that are shifted up or, or risk of mortality uh, from, from the ongoing impact of this virus. And until we find um, a, a vaccine, it's going to be an ongoing problem for older people but we need to think of ways so that they can continue to participate in society. Um, I, I've got elderly parents and I certainly don't want to see them having to shut the door and stay indoors the rest of my life. They want, you know, my father wants to go and play golf and my, uh, my mother wants to go off and play cards with her friends as often as she can. So we need to think of ways of allowing that to happen rather, rather than locking or asking them to lock themselves in. Um, we'll get there. We'll think of ways. But yes, it needs to be rethought. Karis, how bad do you see it being? And um, surely if you tie it in with the education issue, you've got all the young people not even being educated at the moment. You've just got a huge young section of society who are going to have scarring on this for years to come. I think it's a really huge issue. And I guess the danger is that what started off as a kind of great slowdown could become a great depression. Um, with scarring effects uh, being seen, and particularly for, for young people. I do think the education point is an important one, not just in terms of what's happening to people already in education, but if we don't have enough jobs for young people to access, could we also be encouraging them into education so um, they're either in education, um, training or work? Uh, and that will require um, working across the FE system, the skill system, HE, not necessarily the topics that people find most exciting to talk about, but they're so important at times like this. Um, mm. So I think the government would need to step in in terms of that, in terms of education, but also making sure that uh, there are job programs available and probably, and this is maybe slightly controversial, targeting them specifically at young people um, because precisely because there's this danger that they don't build up that experience and those connections early on in their careers. There are things they can do and I think they will look at them, um, but it is critical to act quickly on both of these. Well, there's still time to ask us a question. So if you've got one, ask us on our YouTube comments or head over to Twitter using hashtag Coronanomics. Yeah, it's interesting, um, Karis was making the point about further education being so important. I remember looking at the uh, the degree of cuts that that sector suffered when mm. uh, um, over the past decade, and it's really, really steep. And it got nothing mm. like the amount of uh, tension which other areas got. I mean, it, NHS real spending went up and that created a huge, it didn't meet demand, but it went up. You know, mm. this vital area of improving our productive capacity as a nation and reaching uh, under advantaged groups often uh, really didn't get the attention it deserved. On that kind of area, we've got a question here from Thomas Boys, who's also from Belfast. Let's hear from Thomas. 
So only yesterday we saw that Boris Johnson reaffirmed his government's whatever it takes interventionist approach to COVID-19. Um, only in the last decade we've seen uh, the successive Cameron and May governments implement their defunct austerity program in response to the last major recession. So Johnson's uh, policies are a clear shift from the neoliberal uh, policies of the last decade. Can we see this as a final end to austerity? And why do you think that the Tories have taken such a different interventionist approach compared to the last economic crisis? So, Jagjit, I mean, you've made it clear that you think there should be um, a non-austerity non based response to this. But yeah. I wonder if just sort of looking at it in a sort of historical sense, is it is, is austerity over as a as a sort of policy concept, as a, as a response in, in general now? Is it is it really the end of austerity? Well, austerity is an irregular verb, as you know. Uh, my austerity is your sound money. And that's always the trade off at this point. We, I think there was a concern in 2009-10 that perhaps the level of debt was escalating at a speed that would make it difficult for us to refinance ourselves in, 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 in capital markets um, if it continued at that rate. But subsequently, interest rates globally have continued to fall. And that means the level of debt that we were worried about a decade or so ago is not a concern in the way that it was. And at the same time, we have a very long uh, maturity of debt. It's, it's on average 15 years. So that means in any one year, only a relatively small amount of debt has to be refinanced. And it's clear that the capital markets have quite a strong level of demand for UK uh, debt. They think we're good for the money. So in that sense, we have got fiscal space. We have got the ability to respond. Um, where it's absolutely clear that in, in certain areas, we have perhaps gone too far down the route of, of reducing expenditure. And that is affecting the capacity of the economy to respond to this crisis, but also to deal with its genuine problems, which we well knew before this crisis were about chronic levels of productivity and regional imbalances. And all of that is going to require a structured response in terms of infrastructure, but also the education that we've all been talking about today for further education colleges and others, which of course have the great advantage of generally being local. So if we can get them working, they're, they're, they're places where people can burnish their education skill levels and get um, jobs that can fulfill their income aims over their career. So I would very much encourage that kind of development as well um, right, right now. Um, I don't think it's a surprise that the government is going to be more active. I'd like it to be even mm. more so. Because we go back to the point that really uh, the economy at the moment is being driven down as an instrument to deal with the crisis. It is itself being pushed in this direction to reduce the spread of the virus. So the government has to offset that and therefore has got to use its tool to do that, which is fiscal policy. So it doesn't surprise me at all. And Karis, you at the IPPR obviously were, were against most of the austerity uh, measures taken. I mean, what, how do you feel looking at the, um, the government's attitude now? Are you, do, you, are you, do you breathe a sigh of relief maybe that they're not promising big cuts uh, in public services? I think it's a huge relief that they seem to, well, they haven't changed their tune, they're different people um, within mm. the Conservative government. Uh, it's a huge relief that they finally accepted the uh, what economists have been saying for years, that austerity was counterproductive and left us unprepared for shocks precisely like this one, in terms of our public services being ready for it. Um, you know, with PPE stocks and things like that, uh, but also in terms of having the automatic stabilizers of a welfare system that can prop up demand if uh, in the case, in the event of a recession. Um, it's probably had an impact on our productivity as a whole. It has been hugely damaging for our country. Is it over? Um, I don't think it's, but now is the right time to dance on the grave of austerity and I'll say why. Mm. Um, so I think it is right that this government clearly sees the case for a fiscal uh, intervention um, and it is prepared to borrow to do so because interest rates are so low um, as we've just heard. Does that mean that we're not going to see austerity later down the line? I don't think so. Um, it will be politically difficult for Johnson to do because austerity has really exhausted the patience of people in this country, I think, particularly after this uh, pandemic. But there will come a time when people within his party and across the spectrum are going to be saying, how do we pay for this? How do we bring down the debt? 
Um, and the Conservatives aren't great big fans of tax rises, so I think that they will turn to cuts or at least not raising uh, spending in line with inflation. So I, I don't think it will be called austerity when it does come, but I don't think we've seen the back of it yet. Wow, well, that's really interesting and obviously something that we're going to be covering and watching very, very closely indeed, as I'm sure you guys are. Um, it's, it, in a way, it's nice that we've sort of come close to the end, but we've come back to the question of macroeconomic policy, where, which is kind of where we started, which is nice. And we've obviously talked a lot yeah. about inequalities uh, thrown up, exposed and also potentially exacerbated uh, by this lockdown. So I think it's been a really great discussion. We've got into so many fruitful areas that we will keep coming back to again and again. Before we leave, um, back to our guess the graph competition. Let's have another look at um, the uh, the puzzler we set you. What do the axes? What's the missing axis here? What's it showing? UK, Australia, USA, Germany. Germany went up. We asked you on Twitter. Um, what does that represent? And uh, the results. We get car sales. We gave you as an option. Nineteen percent said car sales. EasyJet flights. Only four and a half percent said that. Hot dog sales, which I think was uh, what Karis went for in the end, nine and a half percent of people who voted said that. Restaurant bookings, which was Jagjit's choice, uh, sixty-six point seven percent of people said that Germany's restaurant bookings are back to where they were before the crisis, before the lockdown in Germany. So we've got a clear uh, majority view on what the answer is. So let's take a look and see if that's correct or not. It was indeed Ooh. restaurant <laughs> bookings, open table index. So that's uh, data from, I think, the open table. Uh, by the way, um, neither Lizzie or myself knew what the answer was that. This is sprung on us by our producer, <laughs> Max. Um, so well done, Jagjit. And I think well done, Karis, in all honesty. Because no, no, you, Karis you, wanted you, to say that as well. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted yeah. to say that, but Jagjit got in there first. So excellent good work to take a that was... <laughs> <laughs> well done i'm sure we'll, we'll have some more um, interesting ones of those in future weeks to come um so that's all we've got time for thanks so much to jagjit and karis for joining us uh, on coronanomics this week and also for you for watching uh please do keep suggestions of what we are coming in from you our audience about what we might cover in future weeks and keep those questions coming if we didn't get it to this week we'll hopefully get to it next week and don't forget to check out our latest full episode on YouTube, which comes out tomorrow. It's an interview with Mariana Mazzucato about the economics of the race for a vaccine. And don't also forget to tweet, uh, follow us on Twitter at Coronanomics TV for all our latest updates. Thanks for watching Coronanomics, What Just Happened. Join us next week for more. Goodbye. Bye.